Hello, and welcome to the first video in Module 5. This video provides an introduction to probability that we'll be building on throughout this module. So let's get started. Let's start out with an experiment. Find a six-sided die and then roll it 30 times and record your results in a relative frequency distribution. We're going to be discussing the results of your relative frequency distribution, so I would encourage you to pause this video and conduct this experiment now. If you need help making a relative frequency distribution, you can check out video 3 from module 2. Alright, we're going to come back to this experiment very shortly. But first, let's start with the definition. The proportion that an event will occur is a ratio found through experimentation. This ratio is found by dividing the number of times a desired event happens by the total number of trials. For example, if you toss a coin, say, seven times, and only twice it comes up heads, then the proportion of heads would be two out of seven. To relate back to our experiment, the relative frequencies that you found in your experiment are the proportion of times that each value occurred in your experiment. For example, when I conducted my own experiment, I rolled a 4 a total of 8 times. 8 out of 30 would be about 0.267. So the proportion of times that I rolled a 4 was about 0.267. So when you think about a proportion, you could just think of that as like a relative frequency. Now, the probability that an event will occur is the theoretical or the expected ratio if you allow an infinite number of trials. For example, think about tossing a coin a hundred times. If the coin is fair, you would expect about half of the time to get heads and the other half of the time to get tails. So you would expect 50 of the tosses to come up heads and 50 to come up tails. The way that we'll find the probability is by dividing the number of times the desired event happens by the total number of possible events. So for example, if we think back to rolling the die, if it's fair, that means that every number should occur about the same number of times. Since there were six sides to the die and each side had a different number on it, the probability of rolling each number is 1 out of 6. 1 because there was only one side with each number and 6 because there were 6 sides total. And this would be about 0 0.167. Take a minute and look back at your relative frequency distribution that you made. How many of your relative frequencies were exactly 0.167? Was it a lot or only just a couple? Were any of the relative frequencies really small? compared to 0.167? Or were any of them much larger? For example, when I rolled a 4 and got a proportion of 0.267, that's pretty large compared to the 0.167. I got 4 more often than would be expected. Let's do an example of finding some other probabilities. In this example, Mike selects a letter at random from the word mathematics. We're going to find each of the following values to the nearest hundredth. For part A, we've been asked to find this thing. It looks like P parentheses M. Now, I want to talk about this notation for a moment because we're going to be seeing it often throughout this module and the next. If you're familiar with function notation, you might look at these symbols and think it says P of M. And really, at its heart, that's what this is saying. Except instead of P, we're going to say probability. So when you see notation like this, the P with the parentheses around it is pronounced the probability of. And whatever's on the inside of the parentheses is the event that we're interested in. In this example, we're interested in finding the probability that we'll select an M from the word mathematics if we were to select one letter at random. To find this probability, we need to find first, how many times does the letter M happen? And second, how many different letters are used? So when I look at the word mathematics, there are two instances of a letter M. So that will form the numerator of my probability. To find the denominator, I need to find the total number of letters in the word mathematics. Now when I find the total number of letters, I don't mean the total number of unique letters. In other words, I'm going to count each instance of a letter, or I'm going to count anything that gets repeated. 
So as we go through the word mathematics, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So there's a total of eleven letters in the word mathematics. So that will be our denominator. Now we were also asked to find each value to the nearest hundredth. So that means we have to divide these numbers, the numerator divided by the denominator, and get a decimal value. When I carried out the division, I got a 0.18 repeating, which rounded is going to be a 0.18. Let's do another example. Example B says, what's the probability that we'll find a vowel? Now, just for consistency's sake and to avoid confusion, when we talk about vowels in this video series, we'll be discussing the five main vowels of A, E, I, O, and U. The sometime vowels like Y in the word my, or W in the word cum, which means kind of like a valley, we're not going to count those. So Y and W do not count as vowels. So to find the probability that Mike would select a vowel at random from the word mathematics, first we count up how many vowels there are. It looks like there are four vowels, two A's, an E, and an I, so those become the numerator, and there are still 11 letters total, so the denominator is still an 11. When we carry out the division and round, we end up with a 0.36. Let's do one more example together. What is the probability of finding a Z? Well, when I look at the word mathematics, there is no Z. So since there are zero Z's, zero is our numerator, and zero divided by anything is always going to be zero. Now that we've had some practice in finding probabilities, let's return to our experiment. In our experiment, you were asked to roll a die a total of 30 times. Do you think there would be a difference if you were to roll the die, say, a hundred times, or a thousand times, or a hundred thousand times? How do you think the proportions or the relative frequencies would change the more often you repeat the experiment? I pulled together the results of several students who rolled a die, and these were the resulting frequencies that we found. When we pooled our results, there was a total of 1,050 rolls of a die. I used that information to then construct the relative frequencies, which we can compare to the probabilities. Remember, we discussed earlier that the probability can be found by doing 1 divided by 6, so the probability of each number on a fair die is 0.167. If we look at the relative frequency column, or the proportion column, all of these numbers are relatively close to the probability of 0.167. There are a couple that are somewhat far away. The 0.154 is a little bit below 0.167, and 0.179 is a little bit above, but they're not as extreme as what I got before of the 0.267 when I rolled eight fours. And this is a trend that we'll notice happening the more often you repeat an experiment. So the more often you conduct an experiment, the closer the proportions are going to end up being to the probabilities. And this is such an important rule for statistics that it gets its own name. The law of large numbers. As an experiment is repeated over and over again, the proportion that an event occurs approaches the probability of an event occurring. Now, we'll use the law of large numbers to adopt another method for practice, in case we don't know the probability of an event. This method is called the empirical method. When a probability is not known, we can use the proportion of an event to approximate the probability of the event. Now, a proportion and a probability are technically different things. However, for our purposes in this series, we will be using the two words fairly interchangeably. In other words, we'll be using the empirical method quite often to approximate the probability of an event. So while they aren't the same thing, the law of large numbers and the empirical method tell us that they're approximately the same. So we're gonna use the two words pretty interchangeably. Let's do an example. In a school of 500 students, 32% have blue eyes, and only 25 people have red hair. Use the empirical method to approximate each of the following. Part A says to approximate the probability that a student has red hair. Since there are 25 people who have red hair, that will be the numerator of our fraction. And since there are 500 students total, that will form the denominator. 
In this example, it was not specified how we should report our answer. That means we could give an answer as either a fraction in simplest form or as a decimal. I noticed that 25 goes into both 25 and 500, so this fraction can be simplified. So, the probability that a student has red hair is 1 out of 20. If I wanted to write this in decimal form, that would be 0 0.05. In this case, either answer would be acceptable. Part B is a little bit different. In Part B, it says the probability that a student doesn't have blue eyes. This example is different in two ways. First, we don't know how many students have blue eyes. We could find it out, but that would actually be a little bit more work. We do know that there are 32% of the students who have blue eyes. The second way that this problem is different is that we're interested in knowing the probability that a student doesn't have blue eyes. So, instead of using 32, I can just subtract that from 100, and that will tell me the percent of students who don't have blue eyes. In other words, 100% minus 32% means that 68% of the students do not have blue eyes. They have some other color eye. To convert this percentage into a probability, all we have to do is divide by 100 or move the decimal point to get 0.68. If you'd rather report your answer as a fraction, you could do that as well, and it would be 17 over 25. Please note that if you're finding a proportion or a probability, and it doesn't specify the format of your answer, you could give the answers either a simplified fraction or as a decimal. Please refrain from rounding decimals unless specifically told to do so, and also do not give your answer in percent form. Let's do another example of probability. The counts in thousands of associates and bachelor's degrees in the United States in the 2005-2006 academic year, classified by level and by the sex of the degree recipient, are given in the two-way table below. Now, this table is called a two-way table because you can read it in two directions. If we read across the rows, we see female and male, so reading across, we get information about the sex. Reading down, we have associates and bachelors, so we can get information about the degrees. Sometimes when you are given a two-way table, you'll be given totals for the columns and rows as well, but in this case, they have not been provided for us. So before I move on, the first thing I'm going to do is to fill in the total values. First, let's find the total number of females. We can do that by adding together the two values in the row for female. So 439 plus 784 is 1,223. Next, let's find the total males. We'll do 268 plus 559, and that should give us 827. Now that we found the total for each row, let's find the total for each column. To find the total number of associate's degrees, we'll add 439 plus 268, and that will give us 707. And then the total number of bachelor's degrees, we'll add 784 to 559, and that will give us 1,343. To find the total number of people represented in this table, we could add the total number of females to the total number of males, and that will give us 2,050. What I really like about two-way tables is they have a built-in check, because if I add the 707 with the 1343, I should also get 2,050. So I always like to check that final total by adding both across the columns and down the rows. We've been told to use the empirical method to estimate some probabilities, as well as to express our answers as fractions in simplest form. So let's get started. Part A wants us to find the probability that somebody in this table was male. To find this probability, we need to find the total number of males and divide that by the total number of people. In the row for males, the total was 827, so that's gonna be our numerator. The total number of people is given to us in this little corner box, so that will be our denominator. This fraction doesn't simplify, so it's going to be our answer. Let's try another one. Example B, the probability of an associate's degree. How about you take a moment and try and figure this one out on your own, and then we'll run through it together so you can check. If you need to, please pause the video here. All right. Let's find the probability that a person has an associate's degree. 
When I look down the associates column, I see that the total is 707. So that's going to be the numerator of our proportion. Then, since we're looking out of all of the people, we still are going to be using a denominator of 2050. Since this fraction is in simplest form, it gets to be our answer. Let's do another example together. In this example, we need to find the probability of finding a female with a bachelor's degree. Unlike Part A and Part B, in this part, we're given two pieces of information about the person. This person needs to be both female and a person with a bachelor's degree. That means they have to be in the row for female and in the column for bachelors. The place where this row and this column intersect is in this box here, where we're given 784. So there were 784 people who were a female and also had a bachelor's degree. This gets to be our numerator. Since we're still looking out of all of the people in the study, the denominator will still be the corner box. So our denominator will still be 2050. This time, we can simplify this fraction because both the numerator and the denominator are even numbers. So we can divide both 784 and 2050 by 2, and that will give us a simplified fraction of 392 over 1025. Let's do one more example. This time, we've been asked to find the probability of finding a male with a bachelor's degree. I recommend you pause the video here and try this one out, and then when you think you've got it, you can unpause and we'll check your work. Okay, the box that I'm interested is the one that holds the 559. This box is in the row for male and in the column for bachelors, so there were 559 men with a bachelor's degree. Okay, so this is going to be our numerator. We still are looking out of all of the people, so our denominator is still a 2050, and this fraction does not reduce. Now that we've done some examples of finding probabilities, let's talk about some properties that probability has. The first characteristic is that our numerator is always less than or equal to the denominator. This means that proportions and probabilities are always one or below. Also, because the numbers that we'll be dividing are amounts, they'll always be positive. So the probability will always be a non-negative number. Now, I have non-negative instead of positive, because remember before, we found a probability that was zero. So probability could be zero, or it could be one, or it could be a number in between those two values. The closer the probability is to one, the more likely an event is to occur. You could think of a probability of one as being a 100% chance. The closer the probability is to zero, the less likely an event is to occur. If an event is certain to happen, its probability is one, and if an event can never happen, its probability is zero. Now, there's a little bit of a weirdness that happens here with characteristic number six. So number six is what we would say a one-directional if-then statement. If an event can never happen, we can conclude that its probability is zero. But just because the probability is zero does not mean that the event can't happen. We're going to see why and how that can happen a little bit into the future. This concludes our introduction to probability. In the next video, we'll be discussing a discrete probability distribution. Thanks for watching and have a lovely day.